Um, so thanks very much, Sahail, for inviting me. Um, I do have to say, just before I start, that a really good friend of mine and a colleague at City, Debbie Dickinson, um, just died this weekend, which is quite kind of present with me at the moment. And she was such a kind of vibrant and creative and cooperative person, which are, I was thinking, features that I also associate with Goldsmiths. So it seems very appropriate to be here. And uh, Debbie, this one's for you. Okay, so as Sahail said, I'm going to be talking about meritocracy and drawing from the book uh, Against Meritocracy, Culture, Power and Myths of Mobility, which has recently, to my surprise, been made open access, so it's completely free to download now, should you wish to. And then, as Sahail also said, I'm going to be talking about entrepreneurialism, which connects to newer work that I'm trying to find time to write on. Okay, so meritocracy today uh, generally is taken to mean a social system in which the ladder of opportunity is there for us if only we have enough noose and gumption to work hard enough to climb, to activate our talent and to make it to the top <coughs> of the pile. And the idea that this is the best way to organise a society has become the norm in a wide range of countries across the world. So it was, for example, the organising principle of Obama's 2013 inaugural address, where he said, we're true to our creed when a little girl born into the bleakest poverty knows that she has the same chance to succeed as anybody else, because she's an American and she's free. In South Africa, there have been repeated criticisms of the ANC for not being meritocratic enough. In Britain, when becoming Prime Minister, Theresa May announced that her <coughs> government would be more meritocratic than any previous ones. It would be, in the words of the Sun, a meritocracy. And even Trump claims that he's a believer in the merit system. So he says, he claims that he lets people into the states on merit. So that system is at work there in his discourse. So this idea of meritocracy as normal and as fair is popularised through a multitude of different spheres including politics and beyond it. We also might think about how, for example, it animates media culture, how globally franchised TV shows, particularly talent shows like Idol and The Apprentice, work to promote a hyper-competitive social landscape in which talent plus effort will out. We can also think about how it's heavily promoted in education, the, in the idea in which gifted individuals gifted institutions and even gifted countries are imagined as being able to climb the ladder of opportunity. And you can see also how that's, this is being pastiched and argued against. It's not something that everyone rolls over and takes. But it has become a deeply uh, normalised, I think, principle of contemporary structures of feeling. Now, how can we understand this, this thing which is meritocracy? Well, I think we can understand it in two broad and interconnected ways. Firstly, we might think about it as a social structure which has as its core tenets social mobility and equality of opportunity and is therefore legitimated by a very different conceptual structure from that of a social system that's based around economic and cultural redistribution and egalitarianism. Then secondly, I think we can think of meritocracy as an ideology, as a cultural discourse which has very deep and varied historical and geographical lineages. So in the UK, for example, we might connect it back to the Victorian self-help tradition. In the US, we might connect it to the emergence of the ideal of aspirational consumerism in the early 20th century and how that works in relation to the American dream. In France, we might relate it back to the crushing of the Paris Commune and to at the way in which afterwards uh, the discourse was of opening up careers to, to all talents. <clears throat> so the form a so-called meritocratic system uh, might take is shape-shifting. It changes. It's contextually specific. It takes a different form in imperial China when uh, the civil service equivalent is opening up to everyone to sit exams than it does in uh, the Britain of 1945. So we might ask, why has meritocracy remained doggedly tenacious as a normative ideal, 
even when, at the same time, inequality has become increasingly obvious since the 2008 financial crash. Now, I think it's partly because it holds within it some very vivid elements of fairness. The idea of social mobility is itself pitted against older forms of unfairly inherited privilege. And we might think about, you know, there, there are grains of, of truth here which are important to, to think about and pick apart. And it's surely right that everyone should have a chance to progress and develop themselves and to work in fields they're capable of working in, regardless of their background. It's surely right that establishments should not contract and ossify to keep the privileged inside their golden gates of power. It's right that people should not be discriminated against. And all these points, which are generally part of the package of meaning, which is meritocracy, are, I think, irrefutable. But meritocratic discourses also, at, and at the same time, remained tenacious, uh, doggedly so, because these grains of truth are bound up with a sackload of mystification and lies. Let me pick apart why. So I'm going to outline five things which are wrong with meritocracy. And the first one is that it is structurally impossible. So meritocracy conjures up the idea of a level playing field whilst not being one. It's never been used, the word meritocracy has never been used as a term outside of a system of vastly unequal economic rewards for different jobs. Those who achieve get paid more, they pass on economic rewards to their children, more privileged to their children, thus contributing to an unequal social starting block. And here we might think about how the biggest <coughs> factor contributing to success in economic and class terms is inherited wealth. So it's constructurally impossible, it's a tautology. The second thing that I think is wrong with it, that we might isolate, is that it ind endorses a very competitive, individualistic ladder system of social mobility, in which by definition people <coughs> must be left behind. In other words, failed talent is the necessary and structural condition of meritocracy's existence. So as the critic Raymond Williams argued back in 1958, the ladder is, is the perfect system, sorry, is the perfect symbol of the bourgeois idea of society. For whilst it offers you the opportunity to climb, um, it's a device that can only be used individually. You go up the ladder alone. Or as he put it, it sweetens the poison of hierarchy by offering growth through merit rather than through money or birth, whilst retaining a commitment to the very notion of hierarchy itself. And this is a really core characteristic of meritocratic discourse. So it promises us opportunity, whilst at the same time it fosters social division. And we, can, we need to think, I think, about how in the contemporary era the promises of meritocracy have become increasingly loudly trumpeted and competitive participation has become presented to us as a moral obligation at the same time as this social ladder has grown longer and longer. When, at a time when, for most people, for most working and lower middle class people in particular in the UK and the US, for example, the potential for upward social mobility has declined. And we can think about how this is in part because of the kind of expansion of the public sector in the mid 20th century, facilitated more room at the top. And the very kind of slashing back of that public sector means that there's less possibility for people to, to climb economically as those jo jobs in the public sector have been savagely cut back. Now, I also think it's interesting um, how the, this emblem, this motif of individuals going up the social ladder is very historically specific. So uh, there's, a, there's a actually kind of an interesting resonance in the board game Snakes and Ladders, which is worth thinking about here. I'll just... And the earliest known version of the game Snakes and Ladders for instance, are Hindu and Jain versions from India, where they were religious instruction games about collective liberation. So you can see, there's one example here, you have the kind of collective liberated beings at the top reaching enlightenment. And what happened to this board game is that British imperialists in India took the game and turned it into a Christian capitalist game of moral instruction. So you can see this version on the right-hand side at the top is from the um, late 19th century. 
And in this game, you have a kind of very kind of Christian capitalist gloss on it. What happens is that robbery leads down a snake to a beating. Punctuality leads up a ladder to opulence. And here, opulence is kind of unproblematically a good thing. Now, the goal is not a collective liberation. It is instead the scroll of fame, which you find on number 100. And the scroll of fame includes you know, characteristics like individualised celebrity, virtue and wealth. So individualised wealth is, still, is kind of still very much the goal today as Snakes and Ladders evolves over the years. It's got a really interesting history, so um, it only becomes a game in which <coughs> black people are allowed to appear from the 1970s onwards, as it, and it becomes a game that's kind of sanitised for children. The snakes disappear in the States, it becomes a game of shoots and ladders. So it's got this kind of whole interesting complex history unto itself. But what I think is very interesting is how it kind of comes to adopt what the political philosopher C.B. McPherson calls the, the rise of possessive individualism. It comes to really kind of be a very graphic way of encapsulating that and illustrating our, our investment in you know, individualised ladders, individualised travelling towards a socially uh, valorised goal of wealth at the end. So this is a contemporary iPhone version that you find um, and actually, I also, on the way here tonight, I saw that there's a, um, a corporate insurance company which is now using snakes and ladders as part of its advertising as well. It says, we'll help you climb the ladder, which is another kind of perfect illustration. So competitive individualisation is, is a really problematic aspect of contemporary neoliberal meritocracy. Now, the third thing I think which is um, problematic is that it often assumes that uh, talent or intelligence is a primarily inborn, essentialised ability that's either given the chance to succeed or not. And in reality, we might think how merit and talent are actually quite, you know, more, very complex phenomena. Uh, for, so, for example, you might have a talent for playing clarinet, but you're not really going to know that unless you have access to one, unless you have tuition, unless you have the time and the space to practice, practice it. Or in other words, what talent and merit mean are complex and they've often been pro profoundly problematically gendered and racialized. So here we might think about, for example, how certain people having less merit was an argument used during apartheid, it was an argument used against the suffragettes, and it's a criteria which can appear when a bunch of predominantly white male book reviewers, art critics or curators select what novels or what artworks to give most space to and how. And here we can also think about how uh, kind of white male middle class assumptions of who possesses raw talent have damaged you know, millions of children down the decade from the history of the 11 plus in England to the kind of eye-opening history of Harvard admissions which has ebbed and flowed between the politics of expansion and racist panic. So in the early 20th century, Harvard um, tried to, to offset what, they talk, what the, the leaders of Harvard t talked about amongst themselves at the time um, as the Jewish problem by, in by including um, a photograph and by including a, a criteria of well-rounded character. So there's been various kind of ebbs and flows in their admissions policies that where you can track the kind of racialized dynamic of admission and exclusion. And uh, this is something Lani Gunier talks about in her book, The Tyranny of the Meritocracy, and also Natasha Warwick, who as well in The Diversity Bargain. And there's a really interesting kind of literature in, on meritocracy in education, particularly in the States, which, which kind of expands on these details in, in more depth. And I think there's also a, a correlation here with work on the structural inequality in art institutions with, for example, Linda Nochlin's work a classic essay, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists? And also recent activism that's been attempting to decolonise museums, such as the work of Museum Detox and Galdem's Evenings at the V&A. So another problem that I have uh, with the ideology of meritocracy is the <coughs> hierarchical rankings of status that it tends to endorse. So, for example, certain professions tend to get put at the top of the social pile, but whether they should be there and why they are there is something which gets less discussed. 
So why is it, for example, that a singer or an entrepreneur become roles to aspire to and reward so fully um, above those of a doctor or a vet? In other words, the way meritocracy works today helps to extend a very narrow status system in which some people are rendered abject and others are rendered successful. And this is really pronounced, I think, in the contemporary discourse around strivers and skivers, which itself is a, a language that comes from the kind of, um, kind of centre-right politics in Australia and is imported to Britain in the 90s. In HE, we might think about how it's pronounced through the obsessive need to cater towards marketized, vo marketized vocationalism, how you know, slashing humanities, arts, and music subjects because they can't be easily channeled into the service of capitalism, you know, rather than actively considering what education and what occupations humans and our planet need in all their complexity. So one thing you know, it, it, that we quite obviously and urgently need is to divest from all fossil fuels and create lots of green jobs. The kids marching on the streets against climate change the other week know that already. But these, you know, the, the roles of environmental activist, uh, the roles of a green job isn't positioned socially as you know, something that we are valuing and rewarding. <coughs> Then the fifth key problem with meritocracy is that it functions as a myth to obscure the role meritocracy itself plays in actually expanding economic and social inequality. The most unequal Western society, the US, doesn't have any more fluid intergenerational mobility than Sweden, the most <coughs> um, equal Western society. But its myth of social mobility is used to validate greater inequality. And I think to understand why this is in a bit more depth, we need to look at another aspect of the prism. We need to look at how it's kind of shifted in, in, in value historically. So etymologically, as a term, this word meritocracy has a very short but incredibly convoluted history. The first recorded use is by the British industrial sociologist Alan Fox, and who makes a, a socialist critique of it in the 1950s. So for him, meritocracy is a term of abuse. He says, why should the already prodigiously gifted be given more economic prizes? And he has this quite, you know, he has obviously has an argument about redistribution of wealth, but he also has some very kind of inventive and creative ways of thinking about redistribution. So he suggests, for example, that people who do um, jobs which are unpleasant, like if you collect the bins for your main job, you should be given lots of leisure time. And so he, talk, he calls this cross-grading. So he has a whole series of ideas about how we kind of might um, you know, recompense people for their place in society, how we might be more egalitarian on a, on a number of different levels, as well as the economic. Then in, in social theory, this, this, this word, meritocracy, travels through kind of social democratic theory of Michael Young um, and his famous book, The Rise of the Meritocracy, which becomes a bestseller. You, you might know Michael Young um, because he, he was involved in the Labour Party's research unit. He wrote one of the manifestos of the Labour Party. Um, he was also one of the founders of the Open University and the Consumers Association. So he's often described as the kind of the original social entrepreneur or polymath. And he wrote a satire, The Rise of the Meritocracy, the first half of which deals um, kind of relatively factually with the expansion of the democratic franchise in the 19th century. And the second half of which is a kind of a satire about a dystopian future where he imagines that there's a trade in, in uh, black market brainy babies because society is becoming fixated on IQ. And for him, it, the, 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 this book is partly... Uh, uh, written as, as a response to the emergence of grammar schools and to the emergence of what uh, people like Danny Dawling have called the rise of apartheid education from the 1950s, this new kind of stratification that's emerging. Um, so, so for him as well, meritocracy is a very negative term. It's pretty much a, a term of abuse too, but it's a little bit more um, kind of a little bit more coded, I think, in some ways. It's not, its relationship to the economic in particular becomes a little bit more obscured. Then also uh, Hannah Arendt, the European philosopher, um, European-American philosopher, 
use the word meritocracy similarly uh, to critique the British educational system and to talk about it as a, an unfair system of stratification. Um, so for her, meritocracy is something negative. She says, meritocracy contradicts the principle of equality and of equalitarian democracy no less than any other oligarchy. But then after this, it's adopted by Michael Young's close friend in the States, Daniel Bell, who uh, was a kind of key theorist of the information society and the knowledge economy. Um, and the kind of the traffic between Michael Young and, and Daniel Bell is itself quite interesting because they're on different political parts of the spectrum, yes, yet there is quite direct traffic between their ideas and they, they are friends. Um, and for Daniel Bell, he reconfigures meritocracy as something that might be positive. You know, he thinks that uh, it's, it's something that might become an engine of the knowledge economy, something which might be a kind of healthy way to stimulate growth and competition. So that's the kind of first example that we have of it being used in a positive context, being given a positive value. And from then, it pretty much gets taken up by a range of right-wing think tanks in Britain and the States, um, such as, for example, the Social Market Foundation, who um, there's a booklet called Meritocracy and, and the Classless Society, which is pretty much an argument for privatising education and dismantling comprehensive provision. So it becomes used uh, kind of directly as part of the arsenal of neoliberalism in practice from the 1970s as a way to think about how you might dismantle public welfare and social security and privatised services. So the word has really done a U-turn, uh, not so much in its meaning, actually, as it's, it's, its value, as the, as the valuation that's given to it. And it's been deliberately and very, very energetically presented as normal and as something which should be the structuring principle for society since the 1980s by the right. But I think there's also another story to tell about how it, it moves from the 80s uh, to the present, the particular kind of valence and character that it takes from the 80s, which is itself quite interesting and specific. So what, what is specific about contemporary meritocracy? Well, I think we might say here there's two things, two things that are very specific about it. <coughs> the first is that it frequently draws on the kind of vitalism of the 1960s social movements and uh, kind of, um, you know, the, the fighting for equal rights, for equal opportunities, uh, the, the idea of being against racism, being against sexism. It draws on some of that energy for its lifeblood. And then secondly, it extends the logic of competition into areas that it hasn't hitherto been before. It kind of extends the logic of competition into the nooks and crannies of everyday life. And this is because, since the 1980s, the idea that everyone, regardless of their gender or their ethnicity, should have an equal chance has been popularised as a kind of neoliberal sales tactic, I would argue, along with many others. Whilst at the same time, the kind of welfare gains uh, of the mid-century have been rolled back in favour of deregulation, in favour of privatisation, with the ladder between the 1% and the rest getting longer and longer. So what this means is that you have the kind of language of anti-racism, um, of anti-sexism, of equal rights, which is deployed in a very selective fashion and in which, in the kind of neoliberal meritocratic framework, uh, disempowered constituencies are positioned as particularly amenable to this idea, to a meritocratic discourse of empowerment, whilst at the same time they continue to face uh, more structural difficulties, what I call a meritocratic deficit in terms of both recognition and redistribution. So another way to think about this is how there's a very insistent address to women, to people of colour, to working class people, that they just need to work really, really hard and climb the ladder. And this is doubly unfair because they have far more structural disadvantage to begin with. They are positioned way down the social ladder to start with, and they have far further to climb. So <clears throat> just to, to think about the way in which this social climbing is encouraged, the way it happens and is manifest is mainly through entrepreneurialism, which brings me to, to that topic. 
So here we might think, for example, about um, the rise of the mumpreneur. And the mumpreneur is a relatively recent coinage. It's sometimes, she's sometimes called the mompreneur in the States or the <coughs> mompreneur. Uh, but it's been a kind of uh, social type which has been talked about quite intensely in Britain and, and the States and Australia. And you might have seen like the Daily Mail has a mumpreneur of the year award, for example. So it's something which is kind of intensely talked about in uh, the tabloid press in particular, in women's magazines, lifestyle magazines, as a as kind of social role to aspire to. And I think it's very interesting because it, kind of, it, sh it shows how mothers are being encouraged um, in these spaces to solve the combined problems of expensive, privatised childcare, the inflexibility of most jobs, <coughs> and, and the fact that childcare <coughs> is still mainly positioned as a predominantly a female responsibility or what Rebecca Asher has called the kind of women are the foundation parent, mothers are the foundation parent. It's a way of solving all these problems bundled together. The idea of a mumpreneur indicates a mother who starts her own business from her kitchen table whilst her babies crawl underneath. And it's encouraged as a kind of exciting, hard but glamorous subject position which anyone can occupy if only they work hard enough, if only they... Uh, demonstrate enough passion and verve. But in reality, uh, you, there's, and there's a lot of kind of detailed empirical work which backs this up, it's usually those who have sufficient private capital to start with who can do it. You know, and the problems of massive exhaustion, of overwork and business failure tend to be downplayed in these articles, in these books. And it's also a means of letting male partners and corporations with uh, very uh, crappy employment policies and the state cutting of services off the hook. So why don't you hear of the dadpreneur, for example? That's quite telling in itself. And this is a kind of neoliberal, post-feminist, meritocratic narrative, we might say. Similarly, we can think about how uh, the kind of microcredit strategy that's been popularised in the global south is emancipating people from poverty through entrepreneurialism is now increasingly being condemned for not doing this, for pushing people in townships into higher levels of indebtedness whilst benefiting a tiny white elite of suppliers. And this is very well covered by Milton Bateman's book, Why Doesn't Microfinance Work? And I think it's very noticeable here that uh, Aaron Banks, the right-wing businessman and the biggest funder of Brexit via Leave.eu, uh, is pushing microcredit very insistently as the solution for Africa. So it's in these, these parables of progress, I think, that are sold to us through multiple uh, and different media narratives, this idea that anyone can do it, you know, rather than mentioning the very structures which enabled those successful people in the first place, which are profoundly problematic, and the neoliberal meritocracy also works through, through popular narratives which recast elites in more palatable and accessible forms. So, for instance, we might think about how the language of graft and hard work is crucial to the self-presentation of many CEOs, where it's frequently combined with narratives of upward social mobility and is op open to all. Um, as the title of this book by Duncan Bannatyne, who gained his fame primarily through his appearance as a judge on the reality TV business talent show Dragon's Den, encapsulates anyone can do it. Anyone being able to make it, anyone being able to do it, is, I think, like the legitimising narrative of contempor contemporary capitalism. And it's really interesting that, that Bannatyne's book is promoted by the publisher via a classic neoliberal meritocratic discourse so on the back of the cover, the blurb says, it tells us that this is a book which recounts uh, the journey of our hero from ice cream salesman to multimillionaire, you know, explaining how anyone could take the same route that he did if only they work hard enough. But when you dig into the story uh, beyond that of the book, it becomes clear, it becomes apparent that Duncan Bannatyne actually had amassed and accumulated his fortune through a number of routes including that of privatised childcare through fitness centres and nursing homes. So, in effect, what's happening is that he's cashing in on the privatisations of local authorities, 
social services and sections of the NHS as they're being fragmented and sold off. And what is being validated in these neoliberal meritocratic narratives is merit as entrepreneurial noose, as hard work that's legitimated through a very kind of classed, aesthetic and populism uh, kind of image of graft. And this is also the same formulation that someone like Alan Sugar uses. Uh, and his promotion of blunt normality has been very profitable in securing his rise to elite status via The Apprentice. Uh, this provided the basis for a, a far more expansive cross-media coverage that he has kind of parlayed and cashed in on. We might think here, I think The, the Apprentice is kind of... It's, very difficult not to think about its importance. It's, it's incredibly important text. It's been vastly influential in promoting cultural norms of entrepreneurialism and competition in the wider culture. We only have to look at the US to see this and to see what happens when the veneration of entrepreneurialism is extended to its logical conclusion. And I think The Apprentice has really been instrumental in helping to extend and embed these norms of entrepreneurialism within state school education in the UK. So we can think about how Sugar has been employed as an enterprise czar and as a business advisor for schools. And this helps normalise the role of competition within education. So it's, it's structurally congruent with how you know, now two-thirds of secondary schools in the UK are academies, which means they're removed from local authority controls and they can be run by corporations. Academies are run with corporate money. It's kind of structurally congruent with the, the arrival and the embeddedness, the embedding of league tables with this uh, formation of competition between schools within education that we also see in the university sector. And I think if anyone's interested in this, there's a really fantastic book by Melissa Benn which kind of deals with the whole spectrum of education in the UK from nursery through primary and secondary and university up to adult education where she kind of dissects some of these political and social formations and kind of offers up an alternative to how you might demarketize the, the entire sector from cradle to grave. So it's a very good book. So I'm kind of interested in how these, these ideologies of meritocracy and entrepreneurialism work symbiotically for neoliberal capitalism and how they operate by framing us, framing us all, you know, even children, as <coughs> specks of capital. And we might think about how you know, texts like these, for example, which are mushrooming at a, an enormous rate at the moment, uh, directly try and work on children in, to incite them to become entrepreneurs. In Alfie Potts, Schoolboy Entrepreneur, Alfie is excited at learning the basic principles of exploitation, or leverage, as his dad tells him, to pay his friends, <coughs> most of whom aren't white, half of what he pays himself. Because, his dad says, this will help him be able to sit in the sun like Richard Branson. And, and you know, this kind of, it's got incredibly low production and art values in many ways, but this, this book is read much more than you know, the majority of all academic books, Alfie Potts, Schoolboy Entrepreneur. So we, we need to take these texts incredibly seriously. They have a, a huge kind of vitalism and reach. And like academisation and, and entrepreneurialism in schools, these forms of competition are very damaging to children, to their future, and we should be teaching them how to cooperate. So to conclude, uh, the, the idea that this meritocratic system somehow involves a level playing field, that entrepreneurialism is the pinnacle of success, is a fiction that serves the vested interests of an elite, uh, and the erosion of public provision, public co-production and social safety nets. But if we really want the reality, or anything approaching the reality of an equal playing field, we have to make it politically possible, socially possible, in a whole series of overlapping spheres and places. We have to popularise egalitarian ideas of redistributing wealth, of taxing the rich, of in introducing a maximum as well as a minimum wage, of ending privatisation, all of which is what the planet needs, what that playing field will need if it wants any kind of ecological, environmental life to keep growing on it. And I think saying no to the myths of meritocracy to, and social mobility 
<coughs> and obligatory entrepreneurialism are key to that process. As is saying yes to genuine egalitarianism, which, one which involves a kind of robust anti-discrimination, which involves anti robust anti-discrimination policies and initiatives, which involves an expansive connection of what merit means, involves education and other basic services which are free at the point of use, and a commitment to cooperation and sharing the wealth. Thank you. Uh, I, think, I think you kind of touched on it around the individualization. So meritocracy, it's really up to each individual. And it's kind of in the snakes and ladders. I kind of think that did it really well. Um, it's, not, it's not social collectives or organizations or uh, there's, no, there's no sort of social, the whole point is, is that you're not trapped by your social category or your inheritance. It's up to you what happens next and you create your own future, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, and, and there's something in that which is necessarily individualizing, mm -hmm. which is also competitive because you then have to compete with other people who are after the same rewards or achievements in a kind of scarcity economy and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but I was interested in the other side of it, which is also the individualization of failure mm -hmm. to achieve in those terms. Because mm -hmm. it seems to be one of the things that's around now in terms of, we were talking about this before we, 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 um, when, I, when I met you, um, there's a sense in which there's a kind of uh, you know, increasingly prevalent mental health crisis mm -hmm. for a lot of people around kind of the downside of, of all of this. Mm. So when it's being sold, it's very much about you two kind of chips. So I can think this, this is a very good slide to end on. Mm. This is the upside. The downside is if you try and get there and you don't, mm. the failure is only your own. Yeah. So it's about your own personal capacities. It's your own inadequacies. Uh, you've tried really hard and yet it's still not happening. Mm. And there's nowhere else to go apart from uh, yourself in terms of like a blame or the reasons why it didn't succeed. Yeah. So there's something, I, I guess what I'm trying to address is one, if you've, if you've got any more to say about mm -hmm. the individualization of failure mm -hmm. and uh, in a way that sort of disappears it as a common problem mm -hmm. because it's always just you know, any, any particular person's mm -hmm. own problem. But I guess uh, it's also that, um, uh, or m maybe that, because I, I had another half thought and mm -hmm. I can't quite get it ready and so maybe we're talking. I yeah, think. yeah, no, that's absolutely right. Um, yeah, so, so neoliberal meritocracy relies on the fiction of in individualism, which denies any kind of dependency whatsoever. So dependency becomes a bad word. Um, and it, it kind of it mitigates against the sense that we are interdependent, which we clearly are. You know, no one comes into the world on their own. You always come through some kind of mother. Um, you, ca you couldn't exist as a person. Uh, without someone looking after you as an infant, we, we are all you know, fundamentally deeply interdependent beings in a kind of multitude of different and diverse ways. So it kind of structurally works in this very powerful way to interpolate our, this, the sense of our own power and to expand this, this sense of our own volition as being something which is um, not reliant on dependency. It both, you know, works to valorise our, our sense of self. It kind of flatters us. It flatters our own power, um, and and makes dependency something that's that's negative and and bad, which is itself hugely problematic. It, um, and and works to kind of you know, we talked before as well about how it works to <coughs> make issues like welfare and you know the kind of structural institutions that support us um, a, a, a problem rather than a strength of society. So there's that. Um, and failure, yes, I think this, the way in which it works, it operates in what Sarah Bannett Weiser calls the kind of economy of visibility. She's talking about feminism, neoliberal feminism, and how that works. But, um, or, you know, Angela McRobbie as well uses Deleuze to talk about, um, you know, if female subjects are made luminous. You know, there's specific ways in which certain types of characters and certain types of people and, and conduct is, is made luminous and spotlighted by the media. And I think that that is something which definitely happens with meritocracy as well, with the tales of successful entrepreneurs. So you see you know, with um, you know, Team Boss, you see with the mompreneur, a multitude of stories of successes uh, which are constructed as hugely individualistic, even when they're obviously not. Artists. You know, yeah, artists as well. Just yeah, saying. yeah. So that kind of interdependence of, of artists is, is 
erased, isn't it? It's kind of written out of the picture to a large degree. Um, yeah, and, and the, the stories of failure, oh, they're often just not there. So one thing that I want to do in my next project is to interview failed entrepreneurs to talk about you know, how they cope and how they you know, deal with it and to try and kind of make sense of that discourse in a bit more detail. Um, but yeah, and the, the kind of the flip side is, as you say, also the mental health issue, which itself then becomes reified as something dissociated from dependency. So you have the spectacle of the royal family um, telling us that mental health is something to take seriously. Um, and at the same time, it, it's reinforcing the idea that it's super individualistic. It's not connected to the broader social structure. I think what the, the, the kind of half thought I was having uh, towards the end of the question was um, part of the not, not, not becoming successful or achieving in these uh, meritocratic terms, it, the, the individualization isn't just that you haven't like, got the billions of bucks or you don't mm -hmm. have the visibility. Mm -hmm. It's also that you're not quite up to the social norm. Mm -hmm. So I think the particularly pernicious thing about meritocracy is it's a kind of self-validating mechanism. Mm -hmm. uh, and this will kind of come to the second major question I've got. Um, but if you don't quite make it in those terms, not only are you not getting the gains that you're meant to get from mm -hmm. all your efforts, you're also not normalized in, in kind of self, in, in the terms that are available to you. Yeah. So the individualism isn't just that you failed in those terms, it's just that you're, you're kind of don't really belong to the social structure that sort of sets itself up as the, the terms of achievement. Yeah. So it's like a double exclusion yeah. from, from that. So I guess the second question, to come back a bit more towards, uh, I think economies of visibility is a really good term mm -hmm. uh, for the art field as well, because mm -hmm. I think the way we operate uh, in terms of uh, reputation, mm. in terms of success and so on, it's entirely built around visibility. Mm. And visibility isn't, um, doesn't necessarily mean economic returns either. So there was, a, I think, part of the uh, discussion around our economies last week, there was an article in Freeze, which had a, a tweet by a dust called Taishani, Taishani, who was saying, like, she's doing quite well in the museum circuit and so on and so forth, and she's completely broke and has to rely on jobs, you know, other jobs to kind of keep going. And she was complaining about this, as she should. Um, but the economy of visibility, um, I think in the art field especially, is attached to a sense in which it's not clear what the criteria are for success. So somehow you kind of have to make your work, you do your work. And this isn't just about artists, it's also the curators as well. And I think most people in the art field. It's not clear what you have to do to do well, apart from like you make work that you think is the best work that you can make itself already a meritocratic formulation. Mm -hmm. um, and then somehow by hustling or entering into the scene or kind of kissing ass with the right people or working hard enough and doing enough shows, you kind of somehow, you're supposed to make it. Mm -hmm. So I think I, I was interested in the, um, uh, the kind of, the self-validation structure that's in meritocracy. Mm. So I think one of, uh, so I'm gonna try and bring the art thing back into the discussion you presented. As I understand it, uh, Michael, Michael Young's main critique is that with meritocracy, uh, the terms of success are just defined by those who are successful. Mm -hmm. There's no other way in which you can say what it is to do well. Mm -hmm. So you, you kind of need to get into the pie that exists. Mm -hmm. You can't make other pies. Uh, you, can't, you, can't blame, uh, you can't blame social backgrounds. Because, and this is, this is where it's quite successful for people from privileged backgrounds to kind of use meritocracy as a weapon because they can go mm -hmm. like, nothing to do with my background, it's just because I worked really hard. Yeah. And you said, I think you, you said that quite a lot. But I'm wondering about this, this notion of so, sociality and self-validation and criteria. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm, I think I'm realizing that I'm not actually asking you a question. <laughs> I'm just making a point mm -hmm. around it. But whether, whether there's something around the criteria-lessness, mm -hmm. uh, like external criteria for what counts as success, mm. which leads into a kind of meritocratic <coughs> logic, if that makes sense. I'm, but I'm trying, yeah. to, trying to just yoke it back, really, in a, in a kind of clumsy way into uh, what I see as the kind of um, success structures of the art system, yeah. which I think are entirely meritocratically organized, but deeply hierarchical yeah. and unequal yeah. and anti-collective as well. Yeah. 
Um, yes, no, I think it, it's more common than a question. So. Yes, sorry. <laughs> but, okay. um, Do you have anything in response to my comment? Yeah, I, I think um, I, I think it's it's you're right, um, and I think that it's it does push away the the structural issues around the the market and fashionability, mm. as well as. Um, working to, to valorise this highly individualised sense of graft and talent, to kind of reify those as magic. Um, yeah, so, so and it is, it has to be understood in that profoundly psychosocial way as well, because it, 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 it works by flattering us, it works by telling people that they too can <coughs> expand their potential if only they do X, Y, Z. So it kind of it speaks to potential. It speaks to um, ex expansion of the self um, in in quite kind of vague and abstract terms. I think it's also one of the criticisms that people who do well out of meritocracy don't have to feel bad about it. Yeah. So if you do well, you can just go, well, I worked really hard. Yeah. And it's your fault that you haven't worked that hard. So yeah. it's up to you. Yeah. So there's a kind of alleviation of the gains of privilege. Yeah. Where exactly. if it's if you have you can have class guilt. <laughs> But it's very hard to have meritocracy guilt. Yes, no, that's true. And there's a very good, um, there's a really good book by the American sociologist Seamus Khan yes. called Privilege, um, where he he talks. He you know he was a privileged guy growing up, and he goes back to his elite private school, and he does a kind of ethnography of what he learned growing up and what the pupils at this elite school learned growing up, and how they learned to talk very broadly and very confidently about a vast range of subjects um, whilst not showing that they were working too hard. So in a way it's, it's kind of interesting because it, it relates to the, the fact that to be kind of super successful you have to have some element of being relaxed in your privilege. You know? But he, he calls it saying meritocracy and doing privilege. So these you know, kind of elite boarding school boys um, are all relaxed, and yet they they say that they you know they deserve their social success because they worked hard. They just happen to be talented, you know, and they don't. If they showed too much effort, they would be um, kind of gauche. They would kind of reveal too much about their you know poor social background. So it's all right. Any questions? Okay, there's two two in the middle, three. Four, five, okay, six. <laughs> Let's take the two in the middle, so, and then there's maybe start with James <laughs> at the end, and then do these two. Okay. Can I, I just say one comment while the mic's mm -hmm. So just while the mic's going up, the Seamus Khan book is quite interesting because Jay Z plays quite an important role in it mm -hmm. as a kind of signifier. Because the the thing he's interested in is the way in which privilege is no longer um, racialized in the same way because mm -hmm. the school has accepted people from all kinds of backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a way in which privilege is, is socially uh, privilege is socially validated precisely through a kind of multiplication of subject positions or like background, mm -hmm. social backgrounds. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so there's a question. Who's got the mic? Paula, okay. Um, I didn't fully catch, you were saying that you're Next step is to make interviews with people without career, you said? Is that the same project? Okay. Um, well, I, my next project is to think about entrepreneurialism more uh, because I, I talked about it a lot in the meritocracy book because, as I gestured towards, it's one of the key ways in which meritocracy is kind of operationalized sense that everyone has to be an entrepreneur but I'd like to kind of focus on that a bit more in a bit more detail um, and again like meritocracy to look at its genealogy because it has a very interesting conceptual genealogy as well you know it's it's, in, it's invented by a bunch of colonial capitalists um, it's it's got a very kind of problematic history itself um, in terms of what it what it validates and then it, you know, it's, it's something which kind of maps onto the way in which neoliberalism has has emerged and been put into practice in in the West in particular. Um, but also, it has. I think it's very interesting to look at it, different facets of it. So that that issue, I precisely because in this economy of visibility, uh, uh, it's the 
stories of people that made it, which are focused on and spotlighted and made luminous. I wanted to do something different and focus on the other stories which don't receive that kind of media representation, which don't receive that kind of attention, and kind of work to provide a kind of broader canvas, if you like. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I, it makes me think that in some ways <coughs> that when we talk about failure, especially in the ways that we know it um, and are accustomed to, I guess, marking what constitutes failure, isn't this also affirming uh, meritocracy? Because we are comparing it to our markers of success. So, yeah, I wonder um, if then, if you know, if there is a way to re, yeah, just like yeah, structure yeah. the languages of failure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and maybe not. Maybe it's about not necessarily calling it that or talking about failure in different timelines and capacities yeah. because. I, my impression too is that like a lot of these stories, they always, it, it has this heroic aspect to it of people that were like, that the, the starting point was failure and then they mm. rose to success. Yeah. Um, and, um, and that this is like, you know, I mean, I think, I think of always these stories of like, you know, like Oprah was like, um, I forget how old she is, but you know, it's like, they use her age as like a special number to say how ah, success comes later in life. Mm. And then, but then it gives you this timeline of yeah. like, okay, is it my time? Is, is this later point the one that I'm in now? Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. That's a really good point. So, yeah, you're right. You know, the heroic meritocratic narrative always involves a biography where there's highs, there's lows. They triumphed over adversity. They came from from the ice cream salesman and um, other and uh, types of failure to to make it um, because that makes it more interesting, right? In conventional dramatic narrow terms, and and you're also absolutely right that that failure. If you use that word failure, you're re-embedding that narrative. Um, but so, so when I use the word failure, it's, it's within sneer quotes, and I'd want to yeah, think about and contextualize what those, those stories are, what happened in those stories, and yeah, not, to, not to approach them as a, as a failure, but yeah. to think about um, what went on and how they, how they narrativize themselves. Mm -hmm. Like Rihanna has a tattoo that says, Never a failure, always a lesson. Uh huh, yes. And um, if you go on Smith's <laughs> He also has these stories about failing forward. Yeah. So. Okay. There's also Homer Simpson. <laughs> Homer Simpson um, says, "There's never a crisis. There's always an opportunity." I call it crisis opportunity. <laughs> yeah. A um, couple of couple of points. Um, the first one was I think it touches on the, the start of the, the lecture. Um, yeah, I was. I was kind of feeling like to write the lecture in a sense it wasn't really critiquing meritocracy because it was pointing out that what's called meritocracy isn't actually meritocracy. It's a bullshit smokescreen for the for the, the powerful for I think what Sugo called the plutocracy uh, in last week's lecture to uh, like a like a PR trick to, to calm people into the, the, the status quo to, the, to their own benefit. But that leaves the question remaining of whether a genuine meritocracy might still be a possible and desirable thing. So, uh, um, so I wondered about that, um, and that maybe, seemed maybe, to like touch. Should we just take that one now? All right. Um, yes. Well, I, I wrote an article called "Meritocracy as Plutocracy." So yes, I agree that it's <laughs> a bunch of plutocrats who are engineering the smokescreen in their favour. Um, yeah, this is a, a perennial question. Uh, could there be a good meritocracy? I think that the word itself has, has it's never been used in a socialist context. Yeah, it's always been used in a capitalist context. Um, I think the word is, is far too toxic and loaded, and it, it doesn't function. It, you can't recuperate it. 
I'm willing to be proved wrong on that, but that's where I, that's where I, I, I stand at the moment. I think if you had, because especially it's never existed outside of a system of massively dis disproportionate economic reward. Um, so why bother using it unless you're going to be, you know, validating different types of merit with different economic rewards? Why would you I, not just use a different term? I think. I think it's too loaded, it's too toxic, it's got too much baggage. So what's your second question? Yeah, um, it was like, yeah, let me see. Um, I think it touches on um, this question of uh, how success is validated. I'm, I'm kind of intrigued by this idea of, of financial reward and celebrity as being maybe secondary to the actual purpose, which is the, which is um, the context of an accelerated society. So if wealth is going to the very top, then in a sense that's anti-innovation because it's holding the resources within a narrow sphere that otherwise could be freed up to help create a more innovative society. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder whether this like idea of the the valorized individual, whether that be like a tycoon or um, or a, a like Elon Musk, like some kind of inventor, is actually like slightly superficial um, uh, in terms of individualism, because what's really significant is not their transitory kind of status, but the overall context of a massively accelerated and accelerating society. So in a sense, so they could, are, could, could, just because. We've got more questions. So. Um, yes, I, I think I know what you mean. Um, yes, that there is a way in which the, the individual, like Elon Musk, becomes highlighted and used and deployed for ideological purposes um, within a system which is far bigger than that. So, for example, there are lots of actors who, don't, who aren't spotlighted by the media, who are completely off the radar, um, you know, the people who work in financial services who, who don't, aren't subject to that economy of visibility. In fact, they're, you know, deeply invisible <laughs> in many ways. Um, so it, it has a, a selective use, um, and it's, but it's very, very powerful. It's very powerful in terms of what it tells people they should be doing. What it tells people is, uh, is the, the badge and the goal of success, you know, what it is to be successful in contemporary society. So that's why it works. That's I, why it's powerful. Can I add to that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, just, just to add, because I'm, I'm on board with Joe's critique, uh, it seems to me one of the things about meritocracy is it's necessarily competitive, um, and also it's stratifying. Because <laughs> some people get more merit than others, and that's stratification. And that happens at all levels. So it's certainly the case that on a, on a kind of me mega scale of social cap uh, world capitalism, yeah, the 1%, so on and so forth, the thing about meritocracy is the logic that pervades everywhere and can pervade everywhere. And for me, that's, that's a response to your first question, which is why I think meritocracy, I don't think there's a better meritocracy. The, the stratification that's part of the logic of meritocracy and the competitiveness that it demands of those who participate in it mean that you're always caught up in this logic. I think that's, that's the, one of the core problems with it. So it's kind of scale non-specific. Uh, but there was a question there. Sorry, just. No, no. Hey, um, this is in response to Sahil talking about trying to apply meritocracy to the art world in particular. Um, I guess when I, if I think of a, a classic small scale form of meritocracy, I might think of, say, the craftsman, uh, because there are clear criteria of success and then progression. Whereas the art world of today um, seems to me to lack uh, any criteria that can be commonly agreed upon. So I'm not sure if I could call the art world of today a meritocracy. Um, maybe we would need another term for it, like a, like a bullshitocracy. 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 <laughs> um, well, I guess I guess part of my point is that all. Um, usages of meritocracy have been a bullshitocracy <laughs> um, and that's not to 
downplay. The, the, I think you're kind of pointing towards that there's some kind of factors about progression, for example, progressing through a trade, like learning more and, and, and moving up, which, which are valuable, which I agree with. You know, so it's, it's good to extend our sense of what we can do. It's good to be able to learn more, um, to you know, ex express ourselves and work together. Um, but the way in which this is funneled into a highly stratified system that's, that's high, super competitive um, is, is, and very, very differently economically rewarded is, is the problem. Um, as for uh, the difference between the, the Crafts Guild and the contemporary I'm neoliberal happy, art happy market, yeah. <laughs> I'll pass that to you. All right. <laughs> um, the thing with crafts is, is you can tell a good piece from a not good piece by the level of skill. So it's actually not a meritocracy because there are clear criteria by which one can judge success and failure. That's not meritocracy. Meritocracy is where your success depends upon uh, achieving in the terms that are set up uh, according just to those terms. There's no external validation. There's no like, objective, um, objective. There's no kind of um, intersubjectively valid forms of validation beyond doing well in terms of how the system operates anyway. Right? So it's a bit convoluted because I'm kind of improvising, but the, um, the, uh, I think, I mean, I've, I've done a bit of work on this, so I'm kind of prepared to, to spend great time discussing the point, but I'm not going to. Um, I think for me, contemporary art is archetypally or kind of paradigmatically meritocratic because it doesn't have criteria. The only way you can succeed is by appealing to the, to the main actors that are already successful. I mean, I take the point about failure was being made earlier, it's the wrong term. But if you want to if you want to enter into that level of the art system, get the economy of visibility, get the reputation, and maybe make some money out of it, the way to do it is through the mechanisms already in place. There is no guidance as to what that means. There's no clear sense of what you would need to do. You just have to try it. And that self-validation of the mechanism, the sense that when you get to the top of it, if that's what you think the top is, you just say, well, I deserve to be here because I worked really hard. I did the right things. All of that indicates that it's really a meritocracy. It's not like you were much better at painting than somebody else. So people who don't do well in it, who are really good at painting, point to people who have done well in it, who they think aren't as good as painting, and say they don't deserve to be that successful. But that's not the way it works. It's not about how good you are at painting, but to take an example. It's interesting that you're saying that meritocracy really means that there are no clear criteria. I wouldn't say that all meritocracies don't. It seems to me the art world power structures are organized by the absence of uh, valid criteria that everyone can call on equally. Right? And that's, that's, that's why the social structure is really hard to transform as well. Uh, but you know, I've got other, got other arguments. You can do a library search <laughs> on meritocracy and put my name in. There's a question down here. Um, can, can I just take this one first and come to you? And then, sorry, I'm kind of no, no, partly colonizing. <laughs> I'm just trying to bring it home too. Do you have any examples of what success looks like outside of a meritocracy-based system? Mm -hmm. um, well, I would say the alternative the progressive alternative to a neoliberal meritocracy is a system that's not based around individualized competition, but which is rather based around interdependent collaboration, yeah? But in a, a non-authoritarian style. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it's a kind of non-authoritarian socialist system that it, it, it prioritizes um, not discriminating on the level of gender, on the level of colour, um, and is is inclusive and kind of mainstreams environmentalism, and as part of its system, yeah, and is is kind of profoundly open and creative and and democratic in that way, yeah, easy, right? <laughs> but you could think about how that functions in terms of, you know. Some structures that exist and which have existed. Um, so, for example, we could think about a lot of the cooperative movement, um, how there has been enormously you know, creative ways in which people have worked together to secure 
um, you know, services and f for each other. Um, you can think about the NHS. You can think about a whole raft of um, kind of forms of social and public provision, libraries, um, education before it was something you had to pay for. <laughs> you know, so there's a whole range of kind of uh, examples I think of things that are socialised, which but which are also open and non-authoritarian and creative. And then there's smaller scale examples as well. So things like Altgen um, is a group, a cooperative group set up by a bunch of graduates who were irritated that they couldn't get jobs even though they'd done everything done everything right, you know, they got first, they'd done internships and they still couldn't get jobs. So they kind of formed a cooperative and decided to pool their resources that way. There's lots of really interesting uh, kind of cooperatives that are emerging up and down the country. There's one in tech called Outlandish, a group of people that work in tech and kind of work to kind of pull their resources together. So I think there's all, there's all kinds of kind of progressive examples, big and small, contemporary and historical, if we look for them. Um, yeah, including kind of interesting collaborations in the art world that you probably know more about than me. I know about. Um, next, next question. <laughs> <laughs> models kind of um, where she comes from nowhere and by her appearance she gets to be somewhere higher so it's kind of a ladder to climb up as well and I was just thinking if how that applies or if there's a like um, yeah. yeah so what the <laughs> gendered nature of Meritocratic yeah, because it's presented. Yeah, it's, it's also the gender, and it's also the fact that it's presented as something natural. So it's it's kind of. Um, and then there's like the plastic talent. surgeries that you can look a certain way, you can climb a certain ladder. So mm -hmm. and that becomes. I'm not sure how much sense I'm making, but it's just an association I had because I found similarities when I was thinking about how this system works. Yeah, no, that's that's true. I mean, you can think about the gendered nature of what it means to be successful in a number of different ways. And also about what I was saying about how today neoliberal meritocracy is characterised by competition in the nooks and crannies of everyday life, where you just have to look at how people you know, kind of represent themselves on Instagram and your, your journey is, is kind of forensically uh, presented, presented there. Um, and so something like the... Australian, what was her name? The Australian uh, model who worked to recaption all the the pictures of herself that she put up on Instagram, saying things like, "When I po when I posted this picture, I um, had been practicing it for two hours and I was feeling really lonely." <laughs> so there's kind of interesting um, ways in which that those meritocratic narratives have been kind of demystified. I think that are around, but yeah, there's definitely a gendered aspect to stories of success, aren't there? So you just have to look at the, the mompreneur for that. You, you, don't get, you don't get dampreneurs. They're not encouraged to juggle their lives in the same way because the assumption is that someone else is doing the juggling. All right, are there any, uh, there's, there's one there. And I'd, okay, just let's take that one and then finish with this one. Um, I was thinking how when we were trying to bridge the connections between meritocracy at large with the neoliberalism and then meritocracy within the art world, um, it seems to me there's a kind of, uh, the key point I want to um, take art with further is thinking about meaning because um, what the kind of wider uh, meritocracy logic says, um, your end goal is monetary success mm -hmm. and that is just linked to happiness. Yeah. So. Uh, so then if we take it on from there, we'd be saying, well, what is a good life? What is happiness? Or is fulfillment in monetary success or in collectivity, which is inherently contradictory to the logic of individualism? Mm -hmm. But if we then also try and take it to the art world, it seems like that's what we were trying to get at with the uh, discussions of a lack of um, criteria for success. And notions of what is good art and bad art have been kind of obviously broken down with such emancipatory impulses. But then it seems in this lack of an understanding of what is good art 
and what is bad luck coupled with a meritocratic economy, I think we're trying, like we're circling around that this crisis of meaning. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't want to prescribe what is good art and bad art because that falls into the scary authoritarian zone to some extent. Um, but there's and there's, it's been a kind of long, interesting history, haven't there, of, of reification of the artwork and its relationship with capitalism. Um, and you just have to look at the the way in which uh, museums and galleries use the names of kind of dodgy dodgy corporations um, to kind of cleanse that corporation of its of its uh, bad behaviour from the Tate Gallery onwards and colonialism all the way up to a kind of opioid crisis today. Um, but I guess th there's a way in which um, the, the kind of the structures of support which which used to be there for more people, which used to enable more people to go to art school um, from different backgrounds without paying has been eaten away. The structures of, of of support which enable people, which enabled incipient artists not to be so precarious have been cut back. Um, and in, instead you have a kind of a, a system in which, which kind of, you know, this kind of crude capitalism becomes more and more, more and more apparent in the art world from the sensation generation onwards, don't you? And there's a kind of, but there is a kind of interesting, there's a, a histories of cooperative practice within art which I would like to know more about. <laughs> I only know a little bit about, but I think that's that's an area which is is kind of if you're thinking about the alternative to neoliberal meritocracy, those are kind of areas that that are kind of just ready to be developed and kind of kind of rebirth of community art in a more kind of interesting way, which tackles some of those issues would be great to behold. All right. So. Um, I've been thinking about meritocracy in terms of magic and also as a form of trickery to kind of hide or kind of um, delegate that kind of privilege guilt. Um, and um, with that, I've been thinking about new age, sort of the new age arriving since the 60s and how somehow like figures like opera utilizes almost as a technology that validates and abstracts that um, that inherited privilege, you know, like people calling, you know, the, the law of abundance, or all you have to do is call for it. So almost kind of giving a, magi a magical quality to um, that privilege. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts on, on the kind of um, relationship of um, the new age, almost as a technology within uh, meritocracy. Well, um yeah, that, that can, I, th I think, I would say the kind of 60s, new age, discovery of the self, work, working on the self, thinking about the self in relation to broader ecosystems is a kind of complex field of discourses and politics which can be connected or articulated to both progressive and capitalist, anti-progressive forms. Um, so there's been quite, a, it's been quite extensively documented, I think, now the, the negative side of that. So you just have to look at something like Boltanski in Chappelle's book, The New Spirit of Capitalism, or um, like Thomas Frank's work, Bobo's in Paradise, about how bohemianism uh, encouraged and facilitated capitalism. There's a kind of a, a, a quite a pronounced strand of writing on that. Um, and, and yeah, you're right, it, it is kind of, there is a way in which the, the discourses of self-discovery and self-empowerment are populate the narratives of parables of progress, populate neoliberal meritocratic narratives. Um, but they don't have to, they can be pushed in other directions as well. So I don't think they I don't think yoga and self-realization are enslaved to the corporate machine. They can be pushed in different directions as well. Can I ask a question? Okay, yeah. just uh, we made you work quite hard, so I'm just going to ask a last question around this, which is, I think coming back to the point around uh, uh, to get counter examples of something like this, uh, one of the successes of meritocracy is that it works really well to, this is kind of boltansky Chiappello argument, it works really well to capture a series of desires and wishes around emancipation, mm -hmm. freedom from social background, yeah. uh, social mobility, yeah. uh, acquisition of wealth when you don't have it from historical, you know, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not inherited wealth, you can gain it. And not just financial wealth, but you can, I mean, social and cultural and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it uh, meets a number of political wishes and desires mm -hmm. 
and it does it really well, mm. which is also why it's really hard to critique it because it seems as though the critique of meritocracy is the critique for people to be able to self-emancipate. Mm -hmm. um, so when, it, when we think about alternatives, to it, you recognize all the problems, you've, mm -hmm. you know, there's kind of really good argument against it that you've presented, but it seems to me one of the problems that's faced when, we, when you kind of say like, okay, what are the alternatives? Is that they all, so like the socialist alternatives, the redistribution thing is very nice, mm -hmm. but it also means that there's a cap. You said like a, there's a, a wage cap, right? And so you'd have a maximum salary as well as a mm -hmm. minimum salary. You, in, in terms of economies of visibility, you'd have a reputation cap. Mm -hmm. Like you could only be so famous because mm -hmm. uh, there's got to be more fame <laughs> for other people, so on and so forth. Um, and all of that seems like restrictive and limiting and a bit dowdy mm -hmm. compared to the kind of the glamour and sort of uh, mobility that's available mm. through meritocracy. So I, I wonder if one of the challenges in terms of a counter-narrative or finding a kind of successful counterpoint or counter-ideology mm -hmm. is whether it's important to uh, uh, kind of give, uh, I have to put it, find, find a way in which those wishes for self-emancipation, which I think does come from the 60s, mm. 60s uh, discovery of the self and mm -hmm. the demands that were being put on through those countercultures, whether that, that can also be met in, in other terms or whether we just mm. need to kind of say like, you know, we've done that enough and we need to kind of do something else because it's only had dis mostly destructive results. Mm. I think one of the ways of thinking about that issue is to think about meritocracy as offering very, very lonely forms of empowerment. Mm and to emphasise the isolation and the, the kind of misery yeah. <laughs> of being alone, that's something we don't do enough. You know, we, we kind of gesture towards it, the kind of mental health crisis, when it's covered, it gestures towards that, but we, we don't talk about it enough. I don't think we, we talk about loneliness, but we don't connect it to these ideals that we have socially. Um, and yeah, the, the alternatives are around what Barbara Ehrenreich has called collective joy, uh, Lynn Siegel writes about this in her book, Radical Happiness, as well, about you know, the, the joys of producing things together, you know, whether it's a meal, whether it's um, uh, living together, whether it's a party. You know. So it's about uh, re reframing uh, and, and opening ourselves up to the kind, of more, the, the kind of diversity of what we can achieve when we work together, I think, and kind of finding different kinds of language to valorize that and finding ways to, 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 you know, to, to bring to light what we do in our everyday lives, which is be together all the time, whether it's with friends, otherwise we're miserable, <laughs> you know, or to work together in, in university spaces and to, and to say, you know, this collective work is, is good, you know, it, yeah, it's, it's difficult, it's problematic, life is difficult and problematic, but we, that's, we, we gain things by, by figuring those things out and creating things together. Good time to go to the bar. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff.